Great. Welcome, everyone, to today's exciting pre-COP26 and World Food Forum side event on harnessing the power of youth for enhanced climate action in the lead-up to COP26. On the behalf of all of the organizing team and the technical team as well, I am very excited and very happy to welcome you, young participants and also participants who are very young at heart um, today. From ambassadors to young climate activists, I am very excited to see your participations and first and perspectives uh, within this webinar. Uh, but first, let me just introduce myself very quickly. My name is Manal Vidara. I'm a climate activist from Morocco, and I will be facilitating the session of today. Uh, but first of all, before starting off, I just wanted to know, um, we will be asking you two questions. And we wanted to know first, what is the most successful example to inspire others in climate change, to limit climate change? This could be anything from any startup or initiative you started, um, from any speech, from any um, other project you're working on. And second, what is your one gallery pleasure that is not, well, so good for the environment? We're super excited to hear from you. Feel free to answer these questions in the chat. And we're very excited to see all of your great answers coming in. So meanwhile, the technical team will be also posting these two questions in the chat, so you're staying on track. And so while we're seeing your great answers coming in, I would love to introduce Maria Elena Semedo, the Deputy Director General at FIO, the Food and Agriculture Organization. And she will, Ms. Semedo, she will kindly provide us with the first welcoming sessions, um, welcoming remarks of the session. Ms. Semedo, I'm very honored and honored to give you the Thank you. Thank you, Manal. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all. Excellency, permanent representative of Kingdom of the Netherlands to the United Nations in Rome, distinguished young and young at heart speakers as me, dear participants. Very warm welcome to this intergenerational intergener session on youth, climate change for agri-food system transformation. This is a great opportunity to discuss today's most pressing global challenge and focus on finding solutions together. I believe it is our duty to harness the power of youth because you are the future guardians of our planet. At the same time, your food security depends on how the current generation interacts with the planet. We need to rethink how we relate with nature. Agri-food systems account for more than one third of the global greenhouse gas emission. At the same time, smart changes to the way we shape agriculture and our agri-food system can turn this around. Young people are raising voices in national and international arena voices that we all need to hear. Last week, you delivered an impressive declaration during the United Nations Food System Summit, telling the world they are hungry for change in our agri-food system and express their own commitment for such change. They also ask those in power to join them in action. And this is what you are asking us to do action. This week and next week, young people are gathering for the first ever World Food Forum, a space for youth to share their innovative ideas and commitments to transform our agri-food system and reach the sustainable development goals. I ask my colleagues to share the link in the chat and I encourage you all to get involved and drive this momentum forward because the world needs actionable solutions. And the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, we are taking actions, working with governments and the full spectrum of stakeholders to transform our, our agri-food system, including production, processing, transport, and consumption. Farmers, herders, fish folk, and forest dependent communities around the world are already experiencing the negative effects of climate change, compounded by fallout from the COVID-19 pandemic. 
Many depend on small scale business for their livelihoods and their food security. While they provide most of the food we eat, they are among the most vulnerable to climate change impacts, such as erratic and extreme weather. FAO supports governments to meet their climate commitment by helping farmers raise their incomes while adapting to climate change, building resilience and reducing greenhouse gas emission. Climate change affects all of us. We need everyone on board to transform our agri-food system. The voice of young people is vital to climate decision and action. Dialogues like today between generation and stakeholders can help identify and strengthen how we can all make more urgent progress together. Next month's COP26 is a crucial moment to move forward on climate action. Today, we can help set the tone for COP26 by shining a light on the important role of youth as key agent of change to transform our agri-food system as part of the climate solutions. Thanks to the government of Netherlands and the many youth and academic networks for co-organizing this event. And I thank all of you participants for your valuable engagement. I wish you a great session and look forward to hearing your insights and how we can harness the power of youth in the lead to COP26. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Meadow. This was a very empowered and inspiring speech. And I, I, I couldn't agree more. And I'm sure that the participants here are, are very inspired by your words. We are starving for change. And we are very glad that the FIO is, is harnessing all its efforts in these terms. Next, I would love to um, introduce you to a poem that is by uh, Mira das, das Gupta. 2020 United States Youth Poet Laureate and World Food Forum Champion to share her art with us. It is very important to link art with climate advocacy. And now you are warmly invited to listen to a snippet Mia recorded for us. And her poem is, said, is titled On, on, on Setting the Table. Colleagues in the technical team, would you mind please sharing the video? Thank you. I am not sure if we can hear the sound. Meanwhile, while the technical team is sharing the video, please do not hesitate to introduce yourself, where you're from, and answer the two questions that the technical team is posting in the chat. Thousands of years ago, when the water wore the fissures of earth, a single sprout stirred in an act of cosmic defiance. Life lifted its heavy arms to the preordained destinies of dust dwellers, some long lost to the rib of cornrows. And the departure of the sun as it swiped its wary wings to the ground. Now, this planet is adorned in abundance. Seeds swing their speck-like bodies to the soil, and when spring arrives, these tiny pockets of air exhale to bring prancing fields, sycamore trees, all birthed from the backs of shared stories beneath the blue belly of stars. At the dinner table, these chronicles pass across the yoke as ships steal salt water as they raise their anchors at port. The food from factory to the fridge, making the short potluck one which derives from a long-standing narrative. The entirety of the universe. The calling of farmland soaked in the entrees and the frayed hem of grandma's apron, the spoon which graciously gives. Even so, across the world lives a girl who has known starvation. As it tickles her throat and curls her hand in waiting under the same sky 
Where salvation has been the soft slate of green growing, the rain slating the rooftop silver in her memory if no one truly owns the land, and an exchange with nature is free. Why are individuals still pressing their palms to empty stores? How are children still not receiving enough to eat as food is wasted across countries globally? In the urban jungle, gentrification jilts quality for underserved communities. Here, there are people who live listless and sleepless beneath a desert of light, dearth reflected in the dunes, the red brick buildings which burn as bright as wildfires. They whisper their dragon's breath, Flame-framed eulogies into soundless forests. Dew drops evaporating. Bees abandoning the petals. No peace as entire ecosystems go hungry. Without food, there would be no more innovation. No discoveries, nor sustainable solutions, no beginnings, no free time for you to ride their bikes on boulevards as they are still memorizing their next meal at home. No future as malnutrition and malnourishment still kneel in living rooms, nations, apartments, are cherished abodes for feeding a life means more than filling their bodies, but also feeding their souls. So feed a neighbor so that they may pursue their dreams to sing on a stage. Feed a stranger whose novel needs nurturing as they move towards writing the final page. Feed a doctor who has many more lives other than her own to save. Feed a brother who needs fuel to run across the pavement onwards to school. He makes his way. Feed a loved one who enjoys crochet. Feed into the spool every thread as interwoven as the systems which we sow feed into them as the horizon feeds into the day what a very inspiring speech from you mira we are very inspired by your words, and we are very glad you're using your art to keep advocacy for climate, for climate change, for climate action, for food and tra for, for food transformation, etc. And now I just wanted to highlight that we we're receiving some very interesting responses in 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 the chat, um, and so I just wanted to share with you some very quick responses. Uh, the first one is for the guilty pleasure. Somebody shared that they love to travel. That is, that is a very interesting response. Um, and second, for the limiting uh, climate change, someone shared that they are um, making their voices heard, they are leading, eating less meat and dairy, they are reducing their energy bills. That is very inspiring, so keep doing that, and, and this will definitely help to make a change. There's another example that was also given by, um, that, that was also mentioned in the chat and mentioned by um, Her Excellency Ms. Semedo, which is the Youth Declaration of the United Nations Food System Summit. So I invite you to check all of these examples and keep sharing with us everything you do that is inspiring. Now, I have the greatest honor to pass the floor to His Excellency, Marcel Bukobom, permanent representative of the Kingdom of the Netherlands to the United Nations organizations in Rome. Ambassador Bukobom is also the former climate envoy for the Netherlands and will share with us the keynote speech to set the stage for today. But before we start, and before we start our intergenerational roundtable panel. Ambassador, please, you have the floor. Thank you, Manal, and dear fellow climate activists. We are gathered here today to talk about how to harness the power of youth, specifically towards more climate action. As Manal says, my name is Marcel Beukeboom. I'm the representative of the Netherlands to the UN in Rome, which is, of course, a relevant role for changing the food game. But that's not my point of departure for these remarks. I will draw upon my experience as a climate envoy, as Manel said, a position I held for the past five years. I started as a climate envoy on the day the Paris Agreement was ratified by the majority of countries. You could say the day we had to start implementing it. Whereas negotiating the deal was the work of diplomats and politicians, its objectives affect us all. So we all have a role to play. These objectives are relatively simple, as you know. 
we agreed to limit the global increase of temperature, preferably to one and a half degrees above pre-industrial levels. We also agreed to adapt to the effects of a changing climate. We crossed the one degree threshold already, as you know. And we agreed to help each other with that. And finally, we also agreed to bring all financial flows in line with these first two goals, the so-called mitigation and adaptation objectives. This is, of course, very abstract. What does this mean for you and me? How does my behavior relate to global temperature rise or climate adaptation? Interacting with, well, interacting with thousands of people, young and old, I learned that it is all about perspective. Sorry, my computer. It's all about perspective, a way of looking at a behavior, policies and decision making. Always ask the following questions. What will be the effects in the longer term? Will it sustain? What do I see when I zoom out? Are there any trade-offs? And thirdly, what is my own role? Where does my influence stop? This is a way of looking at things one has to learn. It requires practice. Knowing this also means you should not judge others on their initial steps on this path, but rather help them adjust their perspective. This by way of introduction. The theme of this session is youth engagement. I would like to share a few things about that as well. I have been working with young climate activists since I started as an envoy. Doing that, I learned a lot about the specific ideas the younger generation has about the transition we have to make. I also experienced the added value of an intergenerational dialogue and joint decision making. And I have witnessed the birth and growth of a very active and influential young climate movement in the Netherlands. Let me share a few insights based on that experience. First of all, the development of a movement goes through stages. A typical first stage is what I call the Greta stage, just making yourself and your message heard in such a way decision makers can't ignore it. This often comes with a bit of noise. The second stage is when the door of the boardroom opens. You are let in to explain why you are making all that noise. Decision makers will listen politely. And if they are pol politicians, they might even have a picture taken with you. That's where you have to be aware of what is called tokenism. Don't become a nice photo opportunity. The third phase is when you are invited back in. This heavily depends on your message in the first two phases. Have you been able to make clear your ideas and perspectives have added, have added value? Do they have the potential to improve the quality of policies? And how representative are they for the group you say you represent? That is where the sustainability of your own organization becomes an issue. It really requires different qualities to grow and tap into different parts of your constituency. You will quickly discover youth as such does not exist. And also that engaging in policymaking requires a lot of preparation, knowledge and stamina. For that, a large base is also an asset. The success of the young climate movement in the Netherlands, and they are sitting at the relevant tables, ranging from ministries to companies and local government these days, their success is based on all these factors. And although they have to spend a lot of time in the Netherlands, pushing for more climate action, they are also very active in sharing these experiences with peers in other countries, who are often in the initial stages of creating something similar. The We Are Tomorrow partnership is the vehicle through which they engage in peer-to-peer -peer learning. During this pre-COP, we have been able to see that as well. I hope these insights help a little bit in recognizing where you are and how you can be effective. Being effective at a COP is a different chapter. I don't have the time to go into that. I'll save that for another time. And if any one of the young climate activists is interested in hearing my thoughts about that before COP26, please feel free to contact me. I wish you all possible success and thank you. Back to you, Manau.
Thank you so much. This was very inspiring and very powerful. And it also sets a base for every act, climate activist or food activist that just want to get started. So thank you so much. Those were very amazing inputs. And I personally was very inspired by them. Next, as you mentioned, the intergenerational dialogue like it's very important. That's why in part of our next session, we encourage you, um, we will be having a panel and we encourage you to ask questions in the Q&A box that we'll find it in Zoom. Uh, we will have time for Q&A at the end of the session and after the round table. And now let's welcome our very amazing guests, the round table participants. As you know, today we're exploring opportunities for generations to work together harness the power of young people and address climate food systems poverty nexus. For this intergenerational exchange, exchange we have prepared three questions for you. And I, I hope the, I, 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 I'm urging right now the technical team to share them also in the chat. What key aspects have you identified that contribute to a fair transition to climate resilient food systems? Thank you, um, um, Samir, uh, Tiwari. I, I think you yeah. are the best fit to answer this question. I, I, I wouldn't want to introduce you, so please feel free to introduce yourself to our, our participants. And um, what do you think are the key aspects that you have identified that contribute to a fair transition to climate resilient food systems? Thank you so much for the question, Manal. Uh, first of all, I would like to introduce myself and uh, I, uh, I have shown my introduction in the question and answer session or chat, but I will introduce again. My name is Samir Tiwari and I am from Nepal, which lies in Asia. And uh, I'm here because of this, uh, I'm here on behalf of ES. Uh, ES is the uh, student uh, association of agriculture science. Uh, and uh, I have uh, worked in a project named Higher Himalay. Uh, which is one of the finalists of Queen Innovation Track. Uh, and I have uh, designed a cold storage which can be operated in zero energy here in Nepal, especially in higher Himalayan region, which is one of the most critical place for climate change. And now I will answer your question, Mana. Uh, being an agriculture engineering student, I may not be able to give the best solution for climate change, despite it is hampering our food system a lot. But I, uh, through my experience, I can come across some solution. First of all, I would like to tell that from the various resources we have, we easily find out that the one third of food is getting waste due to many reasons. Uh, that is uh, irresponsible heavy behavior of uh, our we people. Second one is post harvesting losses and due to the lack of many infrastructures too. And I think the old population is growing in a high rate, but one third of food is wasted by us ourselves. And I think if we think about that food loss, then we can manage our hunger. We can, we can work a lot in hunger management for upcoming some years. And I think by managing this food system, we can meet the present food demand and certain level of future food demand. I think so one of my project name is Higher Himalay, as I mentioned, uh, we conducted a solution for apple spoilage in higher Himalay region by the zero energy coal chamber, which actually work on evaporation cooling and conventional way of cooling. I don't have a lot of time to show the design and explain it a lot, but in a three minutes, but uh, I get, if I get chance and next time I will share my design too. And the project is going to save a thousand metric ton of apple by the year of 2026 which is getting lost in higher Himalay and which has two impacts. One is it is zero energy cold chamber, so it doesn't affect the climate comparison to vapor compressor refrigeration system. And the second one is the spoilage of uh, apple will be conserved. The spoilage of apple will be reduced so that the food system will be improved or the hunger management will be somehow managed. And um, the second my view is uh, even though the fertility of land here in Nepal and Europe is quite similar, but from the research or from the article of Europe production, uh, the production of Europe land is 7.9 metric ton per hectare, whereas the production of land in Nepal is just 2.8 metric ton. According to the article published by government of Nepal in 2017, it means that 
being having the same quality of soil, same fertility of soil, Europe produced three times more the, more food than in Asia, a, a developing country here in Asia, Nepal. That means we have a lot to improve in food system, in agriculture here in Asia. So all the land in Europe be, belongs to all people. So globalization in agro-mechanization in a sustainable way is very important from my perspective to resilient this food risks in this climate change. And at last, but not the least, I believe that we all are aware that the developed country are the main cause of climate change, whereas the developing country are the victim of climate change. This statement can be supported by the fact that the climate change generally affects two aspects. One is agriculture and another is water resources, which also hamper in agriculture in a multiple way. And I think that the developing country are not fully ready to overcome that climate change. So the climate resilient food system can be maintained with the help of climate smart agriculture way, agriculture methodology, such as greenhouse, permaculture, eco-friendly farm mechanization, and circular innovation. And the globalization of all this methodology can be lead by developed country and assist the developing country. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is the answer of the first question. This, this is absolutely a unique perspective because you managed to like agriculture with, with food and climate. And, and I think that, that Ma Mariana would, Ma Marina, apologies, Miss Marina Venancia would be the best fit to also give us an input from, from her experience. She is doing her PhD in ecological and human rights, but she is also working with UNEP and Yungo. Uh, Marina, I will not further speak, but I will just introduce you. The floor is yours. And, um, we're very excited to hear from you. Thank you so much, Manal. Thank you so much for your question and for having me here today. Uh, it's really a pleasure to join this discussion together with fellow young professionals and STEM colleagues. Um, so coming back to your question, I believe there are a few crucial elements in a fair and just transition towards more sustainable climate resilient systems. And those are ecology, respect for human rights, networks and networking, and collaboration. So to elaborate a little bit more on this element, um, first, we need to decide with effort to move towards food and agriculture systems that respect people, that respect the planet, that respect the generations to come. And here I'm talking about sure supply chain, circular economy, reversing harmful subsidies, phasing out chemicals, and more importantly, moving towards different types of sustainable agriculture. And a rather interesting example of how the future can look like is agroecology. Um, in Latin America and the region I come from, agroecology is much more than sustainable agriculture. It's also a way of living, of uh, interacting and respecting the rural and natural environment. And on top of it, it's also low carbon. Um, so agroecology does a knowledge and promote the protagonism of women and youth, and therefore it will be an important element in this transition. And secondly, a commitment to human rights, especially human rights of children, of youth, of women, of traditional peoples and local communities is essential, especially at the decision-making and policy-making levels. Um, Rights-based approaches to agricultural systems create enabling environments to achieve food security and nutrition for all. In other words, in other words this means achieving a scenario in which space, nutritious, environmentally sustainable, culturally appropriate and net zero food is available to everyone at all times. On networks, um, children, young people, young professionals, they are drivers of change. And I know this is gonna sound a little bit like a cliche, but together we are stronger and youth networks and communities of practice play an essential role in knowledge sharing, information sharing, capacity development, capacity building, networking, and bringing together like-minded individuals to develop joint projects and joint solutions like some years. Um, networks are transformational and they should be scaled up and strengthened. And this leads to my last point I'd like to raise uh, in this question, which is the importance of intergenerational collaborative exchanges, such as the one we are having right now and having more representativeness. Um, I've been working and engaging with youth networks for the past several years, and they have taught me that young people in agriculture and food systems do have the passion, they have the commitment, and the much needed innovative ideas to shift the needle when it comes to the triple planetary crisis. But we need more 
meaningful intergenerational partnerships and exchanges, not only at a high level, but mostly also at a local level to scale up and amplify these ideas and efforts. So I'll just stop right here, but I'm looking forward to continuing engaging in today's discussions. Over to you, Manal. No, this is also a unique approach. I, I just I, I love the fact that you were emphasizing young people, but also in agriculture. And I love the fact that you, you linked it to regional inclusivity by mentioning the case of, of your region of Latin America. Um, and so I, I would like to just move next quickly to um, Ms. Zanin, Zaninavu Shuya, Shuya. Um, but uh, I, I hope I didn't mispronounce the name. She is working with the government of Tanzania, and, and I trust that she will give us a very unique approach from the, her governmental experience because she is an environmental officer under the Ministry of Environment in Tanzania, but she will also give us other inputs on, on perhaps the region Africa. Uh, Ms. Zaninabu, I will just leave you the floor. Please feel free to give us your inputs, and I'm very excited to hear from you. Thank you, Manal. Thank you, colleague. And I'm also happy to be part of this uh, session. Uh, I will start by giving examples. Uh, and I should introduce myself, as Manal said. I'm Zaninabu from Tanzania. I'm working with the Ministry of Agriculture uh, under the Environment Management Unit, and I'm an environmental expert. Uh, I have been part of the uh, young people before. And I want to share the very good experience I was uh, having the topic we are discussing today about the food sale to young people who are listening. Like the moment we were young, I remember we used to, to go to our grandparents where you find the food is there, the forest is there, the environment is good, the air, we have the fresh air, even the water in the river, they are there, but the situation is not different. If you go back to the place of religion, you find everything is different. That means even the food we are eating now is not the same. Even the life we used to live is not the same. Even the forest we were using to stay is no longer there. So what happened? That means the food system has changed and it has changed along the, uh, along the whole world. It's not about Tanzania only. So this changing is very rapidly and it has bring impact to sustainability of our food system. And I think it requires less points at all levels. It should start at local level, national level in terms of policy and also international levels. For example, in our ministry, we are working with the policy levels, but what about our farmers? What about our people? What about our children in, in, the, in the primary schools? So I think this thing should change, should go with the mindset change. Our, our children should understand the real situation, what, what is going on about climate change. If we have to change the curriculum, that should be done. If, if we have to train our people at all levels, that should be done. Because this transformation uh, is in the way it's changing the food, it goes from the way the food is produced, the way the food is processed, distributed, also the way the food is consumed. So when we talk about youth, I think youth, they have the, the major role in bringing solution to our programs. And if I, I have to talk about the aspects of food, uh, the food system, I think this can cut across the biophysical activities in our normal routine. Uh, the actors around our, our, our environment, I'm talking about the politicians, the policymakers should understand the real situation. We have been discussing this, but what about the farmers? What is the dissemination method we are sending to them? Are they understanding the, the situation? Or they are still using their knowledge of surviving? So I think to me, this topic is very important. And the, the youth, youth should understand, we also been there. And we also play the role in making sure our environment has been distracted. So we have to commit ourselves to make sure our generation, our kids will survive. Thank you so much. Absolutely. 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 It's really important to think of young people and all of this because, as you said, they are they are the most affected, and now the future generations will be also the most affected. And now, without without further ado, I will directly move to um, Luke Disney, who is working at Robobank and who will provide us a very insightful input because he also is from the the private sector. And so, Luke, please, your the floor is yours. How can we ensure a more climate resilience food transformation um, 
and how can we contribute to a fair transition to climate resilient food systems? The floor is yours. Thank you, Manal. And uh, thank you to uh, FAO and the team there for organizing this uh, fantastic event and bringing together so many interesting voices from different parts of the world and different walks of life. Um, and, and thank you also to the previous speakers for their insights. Uh, from, from my side, um, I, I work for Rabobank, which is a large uh, food and agricultural bank. We're a cooperative bank with deep roots in agriculture that go back over 124 years. Um, and we, we're in the middle of the food system as a bank. We work all over the world, and that makes it an interesting and sometimes frustrating place to be. Uh, we get to see what's going on. We, we're part of the system that needs to change, and we want to be part of the change that transforms the system, which can lead to some interesting discussions in, inside uh, the bank, but also outside with our different stakeholders. Um, when I look at, there's many different aspects to transforming the climate system, the, the food system. Um, it's a complex recipe and a lot of interesting points have been said already. And, and so maybe just from my side two, let me focus on two different ingredients that, that I see in my work uh, at the bank. Um, and, and the first one's in, in the title of, of the question or is in the question itself. It's about equity and, and justness. And um, when we talk about climate smart agriculture, we talk about the future of food and agriculture. We spend a lot of time you know, we'll, we'll say it's got to be a just transition and then we dive into the environmental aspects uh, and, and are happy to talk about carbon accounting and, uh, and, and many other things and biodiversity. And that's very important, don't get me wrong. But also I think we have to uh, not forget about the farmers and the component in this and, and the just aspect of the transition. And a lot of attention needs to go to looking at how farmers can make this transformation. Um, they need to be able to make a decent living uh, you can't ask a farmer to go green if they're operating in the red, as we say, uh, where I come from. They need to be able to make a fat decent living. And, and the current food system has done wonderful things. You know, it, it, we've been able to feed more people than we've ever uh, fed, fed before. But it has its flaws. And one of those flaws is equity. And farmers in that huge, giant global food chain are the weak link, but they're also the most important link. Uh, they have very little power to be able to transform the system themselves sometimes even though we need them to transform that system. So I think when we talk about this, one of the key ingredients for the future of the food system is going to be having a just system. And you can see that when we talk about the youth, we see farmers leaving the food system. We see fewer and fewer farmers trying to feed more and more mouths. And young people aren't going into the farming profession like they used. And why don't they? Because they can't see how they're going to make a living in it. And we need them to make that living. We need them to believe in the system if we're going to see this transformation and if we're going to be able to feed everyone. So that's one point. The second point is perhaps more optimistic. I, I, I think what, what the second key ingredient I'd like to point out, I think is audacity. And audacity, particularly when it comes to change. Um, things need to change radically. We're going into a period where the agricultural system is going to change and has been changing. Uh, uh, as uh, Zanya Nabu said before me, and, you know, it's not like it used to be and it's going to change even more radically as we go ahead. And young people are much better at dealing with change than us old people, uh, even though we may be young at heart, but young people have the energy, they have the audacity to get in and take on change and to demand change where it needs to be demanded. And, and I think that's what makes me very optimistic about the future because I see this audacity more and more. Uh, and without that audacity, we're not going to be able to make that change into a new system because whether we like it or not, things are going to change and how the system changed. If we keep trying to do what we've always done, we're going to have a lot of trouble. And thankfully, there are a lot of young people both inside the system and outside pushing it to change. So that would be for me the second ingredient. And I'll hand back over to you, Manel. Thank you. No, this is absolutely wonderful. I, I, I personally loved your approach about young farmers because because the, the weak links are usually not not really focused upon a lot. And mostly we're looking at the big picture, but it's really important to sometimes go into details on it. And so um, I just wanted to point out to all the participants that you are more than free to ask any question in the Q&A box. Do not ask your questions in the chat, but in the Q&A box and our speakers, if we have time, we'll be very happy to answer your questions. Um, and afterwards, I just wanted also to highlight that today we have a very great mix 
context of, of young uh, of people and participants from all around the world and even our, our, our speakers and our panelists and from from different from different regions of the world and from different generations and so my next question directly would be how other generations can contribute to this change how, how can they contribute to this transformation we have all mentioned that we have all been working on and so first of all i would just quickly move to um marina how is how other generation can contribute maybe you can mention latin america just we're very happy to have your input okay thank you so much for the question at all this is a very interesting question um well i think that we are living challenging and decided times for the future of our food systems our climate systems our own species um and this is just sometimes can be daunting and demotivating especially for younger generations but we cannot afford to give up. We need to continue being innovative, thinking outside the box, and actively engaging in our community research, advocacy, policy making, decision making processes. Um, I, I believe that one of the things that we expect from the generation that preceded us, though, is the acknowledgement of existing barriers to the effective participation of children and youth in different processes, and also the creation of opportunities for meaningful engagement and collaboration to really realize the full potential of, 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 of our ideas and on this aspect of intergenerational partnership and exchange. Um, I truly believe this is, this is key uh, in moving forward. Um, I think many important elements have been mentioned already, like Sunny Nava mentioned, the importance of education, um, which is really key. I have some colleagues that are like climate educators, and they are really trying. I know that there is a question in the chat box about this too. They are trying to communicate the importance and the urgency of the crisis and then what you can do to actually make a difference on a small scale, but also on a, a bigger scale. Um, so, and I think that there is a, a really big value in being able to connect and do and make partnerships to really advance like this very challenging key areas. Um, over to you, Manal. No, absolutely, absolutely. I think this is amazing. And, and this is why our panelists are, are really complementing each other's points. And I think it was really amazing to have this really mixed and very inclusive um, round table. And so very quickly, I was, I would just move to uh, Ms. Danina Bu, and I just wanted to find out that I mispronounced her name. So her, her full name is Ms. Danina Bu Sheuya. Um, and so over to you, how do you think other generations can contribute to this change? Thank you so much, Manal. Uh, I'll add up on what Marina said, but for me, I think when the policy involvement is good, then the rest of the thing will be implemented. Because for example, in Tanzania, whatever you are implementing should be in the policy, but also should go into the plans. If you are talking about the district plans, village plans, everything should be there. So I think when the policy environment is good, then the dissemination or downscaling of the information from one level to another will help us to move from one stage to another. But also I don't want to forget about weather information. For me, I think weather information is very important aspect on when we are talking about food system and the climate change. So I think our weather, uh, our, our farmers need to get the weather, the downscaled weather information so that they can translate in their uh, local language to understand and make decision on their daily farming activities. And this should go through the, the, the primary schools to all levels, even at college level. Everybody should get the weather information and make decision whatever you are doing. If you are in the infrastructure sector, you are building something, you should get the weather information which will help you to predict 20 to 10 years what will happen. So I think to me that is very important. Thank you so much, Manal. No, absolutely. I think you brought up a great point about accessibility to information. I think it is, yeah, absolutely. Farmers should have access to information about weather. It is very crucial. And I, I, I really hope that could happen very soon. Um, uh, Luke, very quickly over to you. What do you think? Any inputs to complement what Marina and Zanina have said? Um, any ad additional inputs um, to add? Yeah, I, I, thanks, Manal. I, I, we see. I mean, I see a lot of change happening and so many great examples from from current farmers, from entrepreneurs who are coming in from outside the food sector with great ideas. Uh, even high school students, we had a hackathon last week and, and they come up with a fantastic idea on how to improve uh, cold storage chain uh, to make sure that food loss doesn't happen. So I, there's so many great examples, but if I had to choose one thing, um, 
and I, I think I'd go back to something Marina was saying earlier. Um, you know, we're going to have a lot of very bright individuals, young people coming in, uh, like Samir, for example. Uh, and it's a critical, I think, that people realize that we don't have to push this rock on your own. We, we need to work together. And as a cooperative bank, maybe that's that's kind of logical. What we would say is working together. Um, but as the saying goes, we, we've got a, a long, long way to go in this journey. And um, we know that you can go fast by going by yourself, but we also all know the, the saying that says, if we're going to go far, we need to go together. So, you know, I think young people getting involved in groups through cooperatives, banding together in organizations and being able to go as a group into with a voice and, and not being afraid to enter groups where maybe they're not traditionally represented, you know, demanding that they take a voice in a group where maybe it's older generations. Uh, I think that's critical, but working together, as Marina pointed out earlier, I think is going to be absolutely essential. And I'm really pleased to see that's happening more and more. So that to me gives me the most hope, I think. Thank you, Manon. No, absolutely. I think this this notion of cooperation is, is really what's missing in, in many, many farms and in many companies related to agriculture. And as you said, we go further if we go together. That is the absolutely interesting approach. And just, so moving on, I, I just wanted to know um, if you have for the participants, if you have any questions, if you have any inputs, anything you'd love to add, just feel free to mention it in the chat. And do you questions, please put them in the Q&A chat box, please. Um, and so very quickly without tarding, I'm looking very quickly at the um, Q&A that we have here. Um, and we have a very interesting question from uh, Ivan Mush Mushana, I hope. Uh, what strategy in place to create grassroots awareness and capacity building of youth so they can meaningfully participate in climate action? Um, I think this I could direct this question directly to you, Zanina, but you were the one who really emphasized on the role of climate education and, and education in terms of food. And so how do you think we could raise um, capacity building of young people, how we could make them participate meaningfully in climate action? Over to you, Zanina, Bo. Thank you, Man Manal. Uh, I think for me, when we are having the, the alliances for our youth, uh, like Climate Smart uh, Agriculture Alliances, that cut, can cut across from national level to the grassroots level. This alliance is a platform where different kind of group can meet and discuss different issues. And also they can involve different stakeholders, not only the youth, but the government people and other partners from different areas. I think Luke was talking about that. So we need to collaborate together to make sure we are finding solutions. Like when we are talking about climate change, it's not a one man show. Nobody can do it by itself. So the, the uh, platforms or alliances can help these youth to, to collaborate together from different localities. To me, I think those, that can help. No, absolutely, absolutely. And and Ivan, I, I really hope that that, that was uh, that was a because that was a great input and I really helped it, and I really hope that input helped you and, and really find a much more clarity to, to your question. Um and, and so we have uh, also another question from uh, uh Carlo Okiedo. I apologize if I mispronounce any names. Uh what could be the solution to climate change trends in the areas where people are aware of the trends? but they are unable to respond to it due to poverty. Um, and I, I think the best fit to answer this will be um, you, Mr. Luke. You have been dealing with poverty for many years and you have, you have been emphasizing the role of, of farmers and how they are weak. And so how do you think we can raise awareness, um, especially in places there are stats, but, but there's poverty. How do you think we can do that? Over to you, Luke. Gosh, I wish I had a really good answer for that question because I think um, we all need one desperately. Um, what, what I've seen, the only thing I can share is what I've seen that, that seems to work, and, and I'm gonna sound like a broken record, is, is what, what seems to get going is when people band together and start to make their voices heard. Um, and that sounds like a very open door. I realize that, and I wish I could make it more. But I, I think, in particular, not only that they're banging on the door from the outside, but if they can get themselves in 
and through cooperatives, through organizations where, which are economically linked together as well. Um, and I, you know, I can focus on the area I know the best, which is farming, that in, in farmers are very, as individual farms can be very isolated and vulnerable. But if you put together a collection, a group of coffee growers, they can become very powerful. They can really start to have an impact as we've seen through fair trade coffee on pricing. It's not perfect. It hasn't solved the whole problem, but it's got everybody's attention. And, and I think that's an excellent model to sit down and dialogue with governments, uh, with companies. Um, and, and I think that needs, you know, that we component is essential. And, and I wish I had a, a better answer for you, but that's the one that I know and resonates with me as the most honest. I think I personally think there's an amazing response and, and there, 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 there could never be a perfect response to such issues because poverty and, and food and agriculture is just a so complex situation. And, and I think that your honest response was, was really clarifying, at least for me, and I hope um, Carla was also found it very, very helpful. Um, another question that we have, and that will be very good directly to you, Samir, uh, which is how can community supported uh, agriculture help to involve the young people and lead to change? How do you think community community support agriculture can help to involve young people and lead to a change? I think you have a great experience with agriculture. And so um, I think you you can help, you can answer this and also answer the previous question, which was um, what what um, what are, how other generations can, can help achieve climate goals? Okay. I think both of the questions are quite, quite related to each other. Uh, because one is about helping the youth people and another is youth people helping the environment to improve itself. Uh, first of all, I like to tell that uh, I was a man uh, was a lot of uh, with a lot of question about climate change and its adverse effect only. And uh, after that, uh, in the previous lockdown, I would I would like to share the experience uh, because uh, the question is out of our guidelines. So. I will share it in my own story. So uh, at the pre first lockdown by COVID-19, I was thinking a lot about climate change because uh, due to the lack of transportation, lack of uh, uh, buses in the road, lack of uh, bikes in the road, lack of uh, an industry where operating in two less number, the sky have become more beautiful than before. And uh, we have uh, the green hills, the mountain was beautiful. So I just thought that we, the human are the one who are doing our daily action, who are carrying our daily activities and hampering the climate. And after that, I found, I find the remote place of Nepal, name is Jumla, which lies in higher Himalay. And there the people was farming and many of the people uh, even the, doesn't uh, ride by bike, bicycle uh, and even bicycle is uh, eco-friendly but motorbike uh, the use of carbon related fuel is zero in that place but they are still backward in the development we tell development or so, we, we are telling it development but i don't believe this is a sustainable development because sustainable development has three major aspects that is social economical and environmental in the name of development we are just uh, going through economical and uh, many more in the topic, but where is the so social and mainly the clim climate or environment is missing in the development all over the world. So we are in this conference to improve our mistake. And uh, I think the youth people can be supported. Is Queen Innovation Track and ES, the International Association of Agriculture Student and Related Science has a uh, Done a program name is Queen Innovation Track, and we are uh, we are given chance to take our idea, uh, to come out with the idea for climate adaptation in food system. There are a lot of youth with idea, but they are not getting the Shark Tank like me. So I think everybody should get the opportunity so that we, the human who are hampering the environment, are responsible, and it's our duty to improve the environment ourselves so i think you should given you should be given idea you should give opportunity to come out with their idea and i think the youth is the one who should think a lot about climate because i have told that youth should think for themselves so youth should think for climate change because we are the one who are going to live along in this world so we should think about this world 
and the next thing is we should hand over this old as we got to our coming generation otherwise we are not we are uh, don't giving their all right to live in this beautiful old as we are living and the first question i would like to come in the first question that uh, with the development of old uh, we are in a, we are in a good pace of development but we are neglecting many things with our development is in the process of development in various sector most often negligence is seen in the sustainability of earth this leads to the negative impact in the various sector like as climate change but at the meantime we the people could in, encounter and realize the negative impact and when we encounter the negative impact we always try to come out with a new and innovative idea and i think the new generation should come with the innovative idea the new generation will should come with the sustainable development sustainable development with respect to climate with respect to environment and this is my answer in the both question thank you manav absolutely that, that was a very insightful question and I, I love your approach for agriculture and, and also mentioning the most vulnerable groups and and mentioning that young people will, will be the leaders of tomorrow and they will be staying long enough so uh no i absolutely appreciate it we can have just one last question uh, which will be directed to um ambassador um of the netherlands if he is uh, still with us and and happy to have the question uh so the question says um the question says a lot of people are asking about how policy can be changed and what the political opinion and options are. Can I perhaps ask you to briefly reflect on this, how policy can be changed and how perhaps political options and, and the political opinion can be also changed about, about this topic? Yeah, thank you for that question. And, and of course, that's a very hard one. Um, policies are, of course, always um, developed, it, taking many angles into account. So having a, a good and well thought of opinion or perspective as, as a group or as a younger generation will not necessarily mean that you uh, will get that implemented as a policy. Uh, although you fully think you, you, you have it, um, you have the best ideas and this is how it should be, um, you have to be able also to, to first of all, uh, be convincing but also be prepared to, uh, to find compromise um, uh, based on, on, on the power of your, of your arguments. And, and I spoke about the experience of, of the Dutch climate movement in the Netherlands. They, they develop many good plans. They, they, they build a vision for 2030, 2050. Um, but then they found that it's, it's, it's really something of, of uh, the longer term to get some of those ideas implemented. That is hard work. Um, so don't expect that after the first meeting or after publishing of your of your ideas, you're done. That is basically the first step. So so be prepared to to be in there for the long run. No, absolutely. That is the harsh reality, but we have to accept it and adapt to it and, and do our best just to to really advance our efforts. Um, and so without without turning, I would quickly move. Um, I would I would first urge urge our panelists to just check out the Q&A box. There are some very interesting questions and, and feel free to answer to them. And then we will very quickly move to the closing remarks that will be presented by our amazing Maria Elena uh, Wombachano, who is an assistant professor in Native American and Indigenous Studies at Syracuse University. Ms. Wap Wambachano, apologies. Um, please help us to really reflect on some of the key messages that were shared during the session. Yeah, the floor is yours. Yancho, Temakotokatoa, greetings everyone. Um, it is an absolutely pleasure to be here um, and thank you for this very vibrant uh, informative and inspiring discussion. Um, <clears throat> I've been given the task to, um, to say the closing remarks. Um, briefly, I just say that I'm an indigenous scholar. I am native of Peru. I lived most of my life um, in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Now I'm based at the University um, of Syracuse in New York, upstate New York in the US. And more recently, I've been, um, I've been part of the FAO high level panel of experts task to develop the report on promoting youth engagement 
and employment in agriculture and food systems. Um, having said that, I have to say that this panel has been very um, inspiring because to me, this panel and all the work that you are doing, it's a celebration, a celebration of the hard work and a celebration of all the impactful work that they're doing. And everyone thinks about use as, um, you know, the future, but I don't think they're the future, they're the now. They are drivers of change who have been doing a wonderful job and have been doing this over the past few decades. What I think has happened is that those voices um, that we've been hearing here and there about the use are doing and what people are doing, we are hearing more and more about it. I feel there is a strong movement coming through. We are more aware of what's happening with the unhealthy state of our planet. Um, just wrapping up today's um, discussion, um, Maria, Marilena Semedo, she started by making this um, urgent call to action and highlighting the work of youth. It was amplified by the beautiful poem by Mira, who she just beautifully described the state of the planet, what's happening right now. Um, and it was just a way to say, we definitely need to continue working towards um, improving the unhealthy, unhealthy state of Pachamama, we call it, or Mother Earth. Um, then the solution, this is what I want to focus more about, and the solutions and the, um, the information I've been reading on the Q&A, and the solutions that have been discussed, and I quite like the, um, the three phases of climate action mentioned by uh, Honorary Ambassador Marcel Bukubum. Um, there was a very informative three phases to continue supporting youth and how youth are coming together. Um, Marina, she mentioned a really interesting point and something that I, I concur with her about the role of agroecology and agroecology is a way of life and how we can continue working towards that. Look from the um, agribusiness sector, um, he mentioned a, what a key point, especially equity and justice. And our dear friend from Tasmania, um, she mentioned about all the educational projects that um, should be heard. But I think in this panel, what has been highlighted, it's the need to continue these discussions, um, the need to develop partnerships and collaborations. But I think it's also important to highlight that if we are gonna, going to continue having this kind of discussions and celebrating the work of youth, we need to hear them. We need to hear every single voice from every single continent because knowledge is heavily localized. If we are going to start thinking about developing policies, most of the time, often a time policies have been made from a single blanket um, and that has not been working because as I mentioned, traditional knowledge, community knowledge, even technology, everything is pretty much very localized. So we need to hear those voices. Um, as an indigenous scholar, I have to highlight the amazing work that indigenous youth have been doing over, over the past few decades. Um, to me, they are along with everyone, they're the carriers of knowledge and we need to support them. There is, as mentioned, a strong movement about indigenous food sovereignty and youth have been leading that work when it comes to preserving our seeds preserving our traditional knowledge. Um, indigenous agroecology is very important. And I think that would be the call to action to be able to hear every single story, every single uh, traditional practice, every single innovation, and be able to come together, to be able to sit together and have this kind of discussion and amplify the work that everyone is doing and discuss solutions and continue developing partnerships, but also continue to develop intergenerational justice and equity. 
to continue working towards a brighter and um, sustainable future. I want to I want to finish these remarks by um, encouraging you to continue with the being part of the forum at 2.30. It's the Indigenous Youth Break Up event, um, which I invite you to be part of. And I thank every single one of you and the FAR organization. And I just want to end this, um, this seminar on a really, really good note. And as I said, this is a time to celebrate, to celebrate every single effort that the youth are doing and to celebrate every single effort that each of us is doing, even just now being part of this virtual um, gathering, convening. And with that, Sul Paiki, Kiora, thank you so much. I just wanted to say that that perhaps is the best way to end this webinar. Um, as you as you said, we should celebrate our, what we've done today too. We should celebrate the, the amazing success of this webinar, the amazing and, and very insightful inputs of everyone, of all the panelists, but also the inputs in the chat and the question and, and the interaction of our participants. I think it is very convenient to also celebrate what we're doing, what, what the FAO is doing, what, what everyone is doing, all every uh, all the all the actions our panelists and our participants are doing uh, from their from their own countries, from their own levels. Um, and so without trying, I, I do not want to take you longer or the five minutes late. But I just wanted to say that I really hope that this webinar was really helpful for you. I want to thank the, the organizing team, the panelists, everyone who contributed to the organization. Um, and I really hope that this webinar really helped you to have your, your inputs renewed, your ideas renewed. And don't forget that together, as, as Luke said, we go further and that together um, we can definitely change and, and drive transformation. And so, yeah, let's keep doing our best to drive for system change. And thank you so much. Don't forget to register in the next FIO webinar that we shared just, just now. And um, let's do our best. Let's just keep the power, <laughs> keep the ambition moving. Let's change the world and the food systems. Thank you so much, and, and you, you can now leave. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us.